umbrella project uh, in London, uh, in the UK, <laughs> uh, for, for a bit. And, and Michael uh, has some Portuguese connections some, somehow, so he, he enjoys our country very much and he visits uh, uh, quite often. Uh, so it's very, I'm very glad to, to, to have Michael here giving, giving a talk, showing a bit of his work on sensorial substitution um, and, and uh, cross modal interaction, which is an area which I'm very, very interested in, and I think many of us are. So thank you so much, Michael. Without further ado, um, Michael. Thank you, Jenna. And thank you all for coming today. I uh, appreciate you taking out the time of your busy schedule to hear a little bit about the sort of research projects that we're working on um, up at the University of Bath. Um, I had the pleasure of visiting uh, Sergey's lab uh, last year. Very exciting to me to see all the changes that the committee is going through and all the expansion, and particularly for Nuno to be here now uh, after working together on a project in the UK, um, including some of the work that I've been doing that I'll present in this talk here today. Uh, so now the title is Turning Images into Sound or Touch with the Visually Impaired Multisensory Technologies for Artificial Vision Restoration. Um, is trying to sort of encompass the overall approach, push of our work which is very much trying to have theoretically uh, driven applied research. And so my background is very much within psychology and in neuroscience, but most of our work um, overlaps with many other interdisciplinary areas where we work in different project teams to try and advance this purpose. And so I'll give you a little taste of that work uh, for the majority of this talk today. Now, at the University of Bath, I did the cross-modal cognition lab. And as I said, it's a very interdisciplinary <coughs> in its reach, um, with our basis in psychology, but we work a lot with people in biology, to give you a little view of some of that work. Uh, very much in computer science, particularly at the University of Bath, but also at uh, Queen Mary University of London, and with some researchers at Arizona State University in the US. And we also do a lot of neuroscience research, um, some at the University of Bath, where we do work using EEG, using uh, transcranial <coughs> electrical stimulation, and then also with colleagues in London for uh, functional neuroimaging studies as well. So just to mention some of the work we're doing that's more in the biological range is working with different animal models to try and understand how sensory processing works at a very basic level uh, with much simpler neural systems than the highly complex primate brain that we normally deal with in humans. Um, this includes work in zebrafish, and I'm very pleased that uh, the senior author here, Carolyn Brennan, uh, has just decided to move from my old university, Queen Mary, to join me at the University of Bath uh, in our new Milner Center for Evolutionary Studies, where she wants to continue doing uh, multi-sensory research on zebrafish. Uh, particularly with both a uh, look at the genetics and the neurobiology of such processing. Uh, I've also worked uh, quite a bit with a lab in London that focuses on bee vision. And this has also used a lot of collaboration with engineering, in particular to develop our way of acquiring the data, where we have bees do a visual search test. Um, so my PhD was actually in visual search, so essentially how people find a target visually amongst many distractors. We do the same thing with bees, because they do it all the time, but here there's the addition of robotic spiders. Uh, so there's a little camouflage spider here, um, which when the bee goes to the wrong flower location, the robotic spider grabs the bee with these sponges, which the bees really don't like. Um, so that way they quickly learn which flowers are the safe ones and which are the, uh, the safe rewarding ones and which ones are the dangerous ones that have uh, predator risk associated with them. And in addition, I also work um, with a biological anthropologist, who's also my partner, and I guess my main Portuguese connection, um, Alexandre de Souza. And in this case, it's looking at humans compared to non-human primates, and trying to gain some understanding of the evolution of our sensory systems. Uh, more on the computer science and engineering side, some of the other things we work on uh, this project here with uh, electronic engineering at Queen Mary is using eye tracking. And so working at the interface of cognitive psychology and computer science. Here to have an implicit uh, method for being able to annotate images 
by using machine learning algorithms to analyze the images that people look at in order to determine what sort of images they're looking for and to use that as a way to actually label the images based on their semantic content. Uh, currently, with a PhD student in computer science at the University of Bath, and my collaboration with Eamon O'Neill, who's the head of computer science at Bath, we're working a lot, again, at the intersection of psychology and computer science with trying to understand how we can map human attention through saliency maps into virtual environments, and in particular, dynamic virtual environments, uh, such as using these uh, sorts of designs that you might see in video <coughs> games and other forms of entertainment. And here, for example, trying to introduce depth as an important cue with the sorts of things that would capture people's attention as they move through the scene. And in particular, trying to work out the methodological issues and how to project salience into three-dimensional environments in this way. And so hopefully we'll be submitting a paper this summer to Kai uh, summarizing our work in this area. And finally, we also have an NGD student, uh, Dan Finnegan, who's been working with us in virtual reality, particularly using popular <coughs> to try and understand multi-sensory integration within virtual environments. And so here we're doing a lot of psychophysically based research um, to understand the ways you're able to combine cues from the different senses when dealing with virtual reality. And so in particular, we had a paper at Kai last year looking at um, how people are able to match up the source of an audio signal and the visual stimuli that they see, and trying to find ways to compensate for the sorts of spatial compression you can get in virtual reality by adjusting the sound source or the source of visual objects that you link that sound source to. And so within the lab, we work in many different areas um, with many collaborations depending on the particular question of interest. Um, covering everything from basic visual <coughs> and auditory processing, um, areas of synesthesia, so how the senses can merge in interesting ways, both as a neurological condition um, or can be induced in people, um, which generally fall in the areas of multi-sensory cognition. Uh, but today I'm going to talk to you about sensory substitution, which sort of falls in between areas of multi-sensory research and research on blindness, in that sensory substitution is trying to develop technological ways to provide the missing visual input for people who are visually impaired through their other intact senses, and try and find some way to build a mapping between vision and hearing or vision and touch in some way to provide the richness of the visual information a person might not have access to. And all this work is done with many collaborators um, across the different projects, uh, a number of postdoctoral students, uh, PhD students up on the right, um, an artist I'll mention at the end, Jane Pitt, a um, number of collaborators at other universities, and various uh, student assistants. So the basis for my work when thinking about the visually impaired and vision restoration is trying to come up with some definition of what vision is. In order to provide and restore vision disorders <coughs> visually impaired, you have to have some starting point to understand how you're going to be able to fulfill that need. And so the classic question is, well, what does it mean to see? And just to open up to you for a moment, what would be some of the crucial aspects of defining what it is to see for you? Anyone have anything in particular to think of? What it means to see for you? For me, is to try to decode uh, color and make code of, of things. We see color and we turn it into things that are meaningful for us. Yeah, so to decode all the different colors that you're, you're seeing and receiving, <coughs> somehow make something meaningful out of it. Yeah. To be able to label this somehow. Does anyone else have anything contrasting with that in any You will have colors and shapes. Colors and shapes. <coughs> so the primary pieces of information you have to deal with and perhaps provide. Yeah. Imagining that, for example, people who are like blind, 
they can see it, but they can hear, and with their with in touch, they can also visually see in quite ac accurate how the outside world is. Yeah. So in many ways, just based on sound, like if you hear, like for example, a dog barking, you might suddenly imagine a dog or what that dog might <coughs> be like in some way. And similarly, for people who lose their sight, they're still able to have a very good sense of what the surrounds are like based on their senses. In fact, one collaborator on the project Nunu and I were on, uh, Dr. Tony Stockman, who's a computer scientist that can be married, and he's also congenitally visually impaired. And I have had him come a couple of times to speak to my students at Bath. And what always impresses them is they'll walk in the room and they'll tell them how large the room is and how full it is. You know, all just based on picking up on these ambient cues through sound. Uh, so he still has some way of perhaps being able to picture Now, what's interesting is, in a lot of ways, people take vision for granted, I think. It's something you don't really have to think about very much, because when you open your eyes and look at things, you decode what things are very rapidly. You can quickly determine what things are. And I love going back to this um, old memo from MIT back in the 60s, uh, when the Artificial Intelligence Group decided that vision would be a summer project. Because they saw there were all these people in psychology and other areas studying vision, and they thought they'd have a few students just spend the summer and figure out pattern recognition. And of course, it's taken longer than that. You know, being able to decode things, <coughs> being able to have true computer vision has been one of the major challenges people are still trying to solve and still trying to find ways to work around. And so, David Marr um, originally came out of that MIT group um, in his great book, Vision, the way he answered this question is that, well, the plain man's answer in Aristotle's two would be to know what is where by looking. So sort of that decoding process, that taking of shapes and colors and being able to decide what that information is. And as I said, visual processing, this process of knowing what is where by looking, happens so quickly, we don't always notice the number of computations that are involved for that to occur. I mean, how you're able to bind the information about the colors and shapes and textures from one location to an object, and then to know that object matches up with something that maybe you felt before or seen before or heard, and how you're able to bring all that <coughs> together. Um, but what's also interesting about this definition is it leaves out a number of other things. So many times if you ask people, instead of what it means to see, what it is they would miss if they lost vision. Many people talk about much more emotional things. So perhaps seeing the face or expressions on the face of a loved one, or being able to see films, or to see art, to read a book with their eyes, rather than say having to listen to the book or use Braille. And so it doesn't quite capture everything that vision is, but it at least gives sort of a functional definition of the sorts of things we can try to do to restore vision. And the crucial aspect within sensory substitution <coughs> research is that how we see is not with the eyes. So the eyes provide crucial sensory information from the environment, but all of the really interesting computations are taking place in the brain. So all the features that we receive, the colors, the shapes, the textures, orientation, are being processed in different distinct areas in the brain that in many people who are visually impaired are still intact. So if people just have peripheral damage to their visual system, say to their retina, to their cornea, to their optic nerve, all the computational hardware in the brain is still there. And really it's just a matter of trying to figure out another way to plug in that missing external information. And we know now, we review this paper, that we have great capacity for neuroplasticity for the brain to learn, and as the brain learns, to be able to, in effect, functionally rewire itself, and to be able to still send the information to the important regions where you need to be able to process it. And we can take advantage of that in many ways <coughs> in order to allow people to use their other senses in some compensatory manner. Well, so how do we do it? So one interesting route, the Duvel cortical implant, tries to restore vision by giving visual information directly to the brain. And so implants such as this take a camera 
to provide the visual input. And then try to provide that information direct to the visual cortex in the back of the brain on the occipital lobe and prevent, present sort of an image of what is seen by the camera in some low resolution sense. And just to try and understand some of the complications in how you step from taking external information from the environment and representing it in the brain, is over here on the right, you have a map of where people say they see light coming from due to the stimulation on the brain. Um, with the numbers here that actually appear on the implant. And what you'll notice is that the numbers don't follow the same nice pattern in space where people report they're seeing flashes of light as they appear on the implant. And so even though the brain actually has these very nice, sophisticated maps for representing the environment, there's lots of distortions in how that information is mapped onto the brain such that doing a direct representation on the brain provides the person with extremely distorted view of where that information should be coming from. And in particular, this can vary from individual to individual in terms of where the locations on the map in the brain appear. And so people actually see something. They'll see flashes of light with this direct implant, but unfortunately it's not instant vision. They don't have it correspond directly to where it should be in the environment. And so what are the different ways we can restore vision? Well, one way is to try and do something to restore the organ itself. And so there have been some cases where people have been able to do surgery, for example, removing congenital cataracts, to allow the visual information to return to the person. And another way, as in with this cortical implant here on the right, is to have some sort of neurostimulator where that information is provided directly to the brain, um, coming from an artificial organ, a camera of some sort, with that information reduced in resolution. Some other options, which are a little more sort of further afield that people normally think about, is trying to provide that information through an intact sensory pathway, and such as hearing or through touch. And you can example in a moment of why there's a tongue there as an example of touch. And here, it's again having some sort of artificial organ, a camera, where the information is simplified, coded, and then transduced through that intact sensory pathway. And allowing people to then process the information through all the same brain regions that they would normally process vision. And so that's the whole key idea behind sensory substitution and augmentation. And in many ways, one way is to find, so I took part in this panel at the Edinburgh Science Festival on biohacking. Um, and so I was the one non-invasive biohacker there. Other people were implanting magnets under their skin and doing some interesting things like that. Um, but in this case, it's sort of a form of non-invasive biohacking because the idea is that you're just providing the information externally to one of the other senses and then allowing all the rewiring and everything to occur essentially in the person's brain as they learn to use it. And the primary auditory device I work with and I'll describe today is the voice. Um, which originally was thought of and described um, in Peter Mayer's 1992 paper, and really research in using this device has sort of blossomed in the last 10 years or so um, that we and a number of other neuroscience labs have started working with. Now, one of the first things we have to deal with is how you do this simplification and coding, because if you just think of this as an information processing issue, is an enormous challenge because vision is the primary sense that we humans use for interacting and receiving information about the world. And it has incredible spatial acuity and is fantastic at parallel processing. So we can receive information, colors, shapes, textures, and such from all regions of the visual field and to a certain extent process that information in parallel, even sort of gaining some semantic information about what is in different regions. And some estimates try to determine sort of how many bits per second you're able to process in it. And it's an enormous number, particularly when you contrast it with the other senses, such as touch. So in terms of tactile processing, it's kind of clear that the skin can operate as an analog to the retina. So certainly if you look in the eye, you know, an image of the world is presented 
upside down on the back of the eye, and essentially represented in the same way back in digital cortex. And you can imagine having some sort of sensation of an image pressed on you. So if you were looking, say, at the letter M back there with Mitty in the background, you can imagine sort of feeling the letter M pressed on your skin, and you might be able to recognize what that is. But here the problem is, is that although the skin gives you the spatial analog, it has much lower acuity compared to vision. Uh, estimates more like 100 bits per second. And also, many studies, psychophysically looking at touch, have found it's much more of a serial processing sense. So you can't really detect that many things in parallel. You can only sort of pay attention to one thing at a time, and generally you have to be fairly active in doing it. So if the items are just sort of pressed on your skin, it's much harder to recognize them than if you move across them. So reading Braille, for example, much easier if they're moving actively across it. You have to pick up all, all the information up one at a time. <coughs> so the auditory system is a little bit better than the tactile system in terms of its information processing capabilities. Although you can see we're still several orders lower than where we need to be compared to vision. So it can process more information than touch, but not quite as much as vision. Um, and also, its specialty, temporal acuity, is different than vision. So in vision, we have very good spatial acuity, but in hearing, we have very good temporal acuity. You can hear very small <coughs> time differences in sounds, in part what perhaps makes music so nice to listen to. That you can listen to multiple instruments at the same time and hear very quick changes in the notes as you listen to it. But unlike touch, where you have a clear spatial analog to the retina, how might you present images in sound? So that's where it takes a little bit of a leap. So again, with touch, it's fairly simple. And working with touch as a sensory substitution device originally goes back to the 60s with the late Paul Bakirmita's work, uh, where he <coughs> reconfigured a dental chair to have all these little pins that would press on your back and provide the image that was in front of the camera to your back. Um, nowadays, and something else we now have in my lab, is the tongue display unit, or the brain port in its commercial um, form, um, provides the same information that used to go on your back, but in a much more mobile form. In this case, you take advantage of saliva as being conductive, and you have very, just a little bit of electroconductance, and so you actually feel the images on your tongue. Uh, instead of on your back. And I have to tell you, it creates a very interesting feeling. Um, it's a bit almost like you, I don't know if you've ever had that popping candy. Um, and it's a bit like putting far too much of that in your mouth and then suddenly feeling the fizzing on your tongue uh, going for a long period of time. Then you go back to the dentist. Yes, <laughs> then you go back to the dental chair for that later, yes. So unfortunately, the dental chair, you can't move around very well, uh, but it's perhaps more comfortable also than because if you have the device in your mouth for very long, you do start salivating um, a lot. And of course, you can't speak that as well. Um, but the basic idea has been found to work very well. <coughs> and one thing that's nice about it is it is straightforward and just sort of presenting the image on whatever part of the body you put it. And also, you can receive the information more or less in real time. And so if you have something moving, you can feel the movement very easily. But this is all fairly straightforward. How can we get <coughs> sound? Another example of the original setup, um, again, which was fairly large compared to what people need now. Okay, so to take a step back before trying to sort of reveal how the voice and our similar devices work, um, first I want you to think about these images. And each of these images has a name. So one of these images is called Kiki, and one of these is called Booba. So which would you say is the name of this image? Of course, I mean, around it, so of course it's a synesthesia approach. Of course, the, the, the more volume you, you place, like ball, with, with, with this will be the left image. So it's booba. Of course. Yeah. Does, does anyone, does everyone, who agrees, I guess, if I show show hands, that that's booba? No. Does anyone think that's kiki? We have one person who's brave. <laughs> yeah, well, What's fascinating is pretty much 90% of people would name that as Kiki, um, and you see the similar thing with Booba, uh, for some of the reasons you mentioned precisely. Let's think about a couple of other domains. Um, so here you have two objects, 
I'm going to play two sounds. associate with which object? So starting with this one here. Severe. Which one? Severe. The bigger one here? Yeah. At the bottom? Yeah. Does anyone associate that sound with the diamond? Yeah. And, and again, a number of studies have found a similar thing, um, <coughs> where sounds that are high in pitch are associated with things that are high in elevation, bright colors, small, angular in shape. Low pitch is associated with things that are lower in elevation, dark color, large, and more likely rounded in shape. Bright colors also tend to be associated with loud sounds. Dark colors also tend to be associated with quieter sounds. And in general, all of these different connections have been dubbed cross-modal correspondences. Because you can look at how you have these connections across our different sensory modalities um, across multiple modalities. And what's fascinating is in most of these studies, you'll find these things like bubakiki are cross-cultural. You can find um, their existence in prelingual infants. And it suggests that people have sort of a natural understanding, particularly when you see so much agreement among large groups of people, that it suggests there's something perhaps hardwired or at least learned very early on in development about these connections between the senses. And so, in many ways, this gives us a starting point to think about how to turn visions and in, in visual information into sound. It gives us this perceptual code to work with. And so, essentially, if we then just sort of take an image and think of it as information, we can use these cross-modal correspondences to try and provide it into sound. So if we break it down to sort of large pixels in this case, we can take an example pixel up there, so on the y-axis, it's high up, on the x-axis to the right, and it's fairly bright. Um, over here, instead, we have one that's low to the left and relatively dark. And so if we use these cross modal correspondences, we can then have this pixel up here on the right be high pitch for its high location. For the fact that it's on the right, we can use stereo, so you can hear something on the right, right panning. And because it's bright, it can be loud. In contrast, this lower pixel here on the left can be lower pitch, be heard on the left, and because it's dark, it can be relatively quiet. And furthermore, to take advantage of the temporal acuity of the auditory system, we also add a temporal feature as well. And this also serves to reduce the amount of information that you're dealing with at any point in time. And so what we do with the voice is you essentially hear one column at a time, and it takes a second to scan across the image. And so you hear the sound go from left to right over the course of a second, hearing the variety of pitches that are present at different volume levels, depending on how bright they are. Um, so recently, so we've been working with this um, congenitally blind uh, programmer in India, Pranav Lal, um, with the voice. And these, that image I just showed you, he took when going camping in the Himalayas. And he enjoys using the voice primarily for artistic expression. Um, he enjoys photography. So he holds all these nice open exhibitions of his photography in India. And so for this, we made a video uh, to describe the work for new scientists, which gives you a few example sounds. So one thing you clearly would have noticed is that as it moves through the images, you go through very simple shapes where it's easy to sort of hear how the features go together. And clearly, once you go to the real environment, 
that sort of reveals how much information we're normally dealing with in vision, because the sound correspondingly becomes far more complex. And so clearly, for with my background in psychology and neuroscience, one of the fascinating things about this approach is when you have someone as a new participant using it, you're starting more or less at the same level. So you don't just hear the sound, you immediately go, oh yes, of course, that's a mountain and it's coming down from left to right. It does take learning. And so a lot of our work is surrounding the learning process, the attentional problems that occur, uh, the human factors type issues at using something like this, and trying to figure out ways to make it easier to use. And so, again, the simple setup is you have to have some sort of camera. Here we use um, sunglasses that just have essentially a webcam in the bridge of the nose. You need some small computer or uh, mobile phone to process the images, turn them to sound, and play to the person. And give you a couple more examples. Again, with sort of simple things, you can hear that it's fairly easy with just a basic understanding of how to determine basic patterns. But then, uh, I'm originally from Arizona, and so, of course, again, once you have <coughs> realistic ones, you'll find that it's great for complexity. But what's fascinating about it is with just a little bit of regimented training, people can come to gain an understanding of realistic images fairly well. Not to the same degree as vision, where they necessarily can appreciate you know, the nature and the shape of the clouds versus the cactus and such, but with some knowledge of the environment they're in, you can use that knowledge to interpret the sound and to decode what sort of thing would have that shape as they're able to decode the sound. So, some of our work has been trying to determine how we can work with both the technical limits and also the perceptual limits of the different devices. And so in the lab, we're primarily using the voice and the TDU. Um, and some other similar things that try to restore vision are the PSVA, which is also an auditory device developed in Louvre, Belgium. And the Argus II is a retinal implant device. Uh, so the implant is actually in the eye the patients still have to have a functioning optic nerve. And so it does the stimulation um, just at the level that they can receive it and send it to the optic nerve. And what's interesting is I mean, one reason we like the voice is it can portray a lot of information, though you have to deal with the challenges of how well people can actually uh, pull out the shape information <coughs> from that stream. And so another way we've been able to look at that is to look at it in terms of the actual functional acuity that people have. And essentially for that, we use standard optician tests. So we can determine the fine level acuity that people have. <coughs> and so in many ways, it would be like these eye charts here, um, except we use this thing called the Snell and Tumbling E to determine how fine a resolution that they can pick up using these different devices. And looking across a whole spectrum of different restoration techniques, you have the epiretinal and retinal implants at the top, the cortical implant in the middle. Um, stem cell treatments are becoming more available these days, um, starting at the bottom. And at the very bottom here, you have the two sensory substitution devices. And what's fascinating is that with the sensory substitution, of course, you're not directly plugging into the visual system. You're trying to sort of hack your way around it to go through touch or through hearing. And in terms of the resolution that people can actually pick up on using these tests, um, you find that the voice using audio is able to get a much better uh, acuity than any other devices. And the TDU um, is not quite as good, but it's mostly coming down to the technical limitations of it. And in some ways, it's because the TDU, as I mentioned, is good for picking up on motion and such. And so it tends to fare less well with things that are static. And certainly this type of QD test is a static one. But in terms of the cost, particularly uh, the voice being very low cost, it also helps because incidences of visual impairment are on the rise in developing countries. And being able to afford even the TDU, much less the more expensive implants, is out of reach in many of those countries. 
fact that something like the voice can be run on a mobile phone at a lower resolution, which will certainly be a higher resolution <coughs> soon, uh, certainly opens up a lot of uh, capabilities for developing countries. So with more complex things, and also in preparation for some of the work we're going to do with become display unit, uh, we looked at how well people could recognize objects using the voice, so, to, so through sound, at uh, different resolutions. And so this runs from sort of full resolution at the top with basic black and white images, going all the way down to very low resolutions. And in this case, finding that with only 10 minutes of training before beginning, people are able to match up what they hear either with images that they see or images that they touch. Uh, far above chance levels. Um, usually, again, only 10 minutes training, around 50% correct, with generally making errors that are sort of intelligent. For example, they might confuse the horse and the dog, um, but very rarely do they confuse the horse with the car or piece of fruit. And so they're able to determine a lot of the features and it's the fine differences that are difficult without extensive training. But one of the larger issues we're trying to deal with are some of these capacity limits on information processing, which largely come about through being able to use attention to pick up on the relevant features when using a device like the voice to hear things through sound. And in particular, although we can do parallel processing to a certain extent with sound, because we can't process as much information as vision, it's still going to have some restrictions on how much information you can extract from an image. And so in particular here, we use a classic paradigm from cognitive psychology, where you <coughs> present all the information either simultaneously or successively, and found clear limits such that people could process the information much better if they were given just half at a time, rather than having the whole image presented to them at once. Suggesting it's much easier for them to acquire half of the information the other half that sort of mentally put the two together in order to pick up on all. And what's interesting from a training perspective is it seems most participants when training have an attentional bias just to pay attention to the higher frequencies over the lower frequencies as well. So generally people are already sort of doing this when they listen and only by separating the two are they able to then pay attention to those two separately. Now a large part that comes from the coding process Whereas it scans across the image, it's fairly challenging with auditory attention to pay attention to high pitch and low pitch simultaneously. Um, in other ways, we've been examining more functional use of the device as well. Um, in this case, it's with a participant who trained for three days using it and so had much more experience than we gave people in some of the prior studies and tried to present sort of a step up from our lab-based, computer-based studies to something a little more ecological in terms of being able to look for things, but obviously in a very simplified environment with very few distractors um, initially. But what we found encouraging here is all the participants um, who had these three days of training were able to have an intuitive sense of not only the location, but also the shape and size of objects. And so generally the grasping was always appropriate to the size of the object, besides just the location. <clears throat> Similarly, and particularly in trying to make more comparisons between the voice and the tongue display unit, is trying to understand the amount of training that's required for people to be able to use this for navigation and obstacle avoidance as well. Um, so here's a participant who only trained for 15 minutes before taking out his navigation pass, where in many ways the auditory coding is fairly simple in terms of being able to use stereo to determine the relative location of obstacles that might come in the path. But the challenge is then using pitch to go from a two-dimensional format to the three-dimensional format of the obstacle course. Now in many ways in vision, we're able to do this rapidly. So if you close one eye and you just have monocular information, you can use many other texture cues. You can look at how an object might obscure something behind it to determine how far away things are. Um, but again, being able to extract that information from sound clearly will take some training. 
And in a lot of this work, we're also trying to expand and take advantage of our basic research into how blindness changes cognition. Because one problem that certainly always comes up is whether designing for people who are congenitally blind versus those who are late blind <coughs> brings up any important differences. Because certainly with someone who's late blind, you can take advantage of all the visual knowledge they have, their ability to imagine what the world looks like, um, even though they've lost their vision, and map things onto that. But the congenitally blind, they have a very different experience of the world that comes through their different senses, so proprioception, through touch, and through hearing only. And certainly in some of our work focusing on spatial reference frames, we found that congenitally blind and late blind people do differ in forms of how they navigate the world. So in particular, what we found is that people with visual experience, so sighted people or late blind people, tend to be able to use allocentric representations because you can process things visually in parallel. You can determine where things are relevant to one another and form sort of a, a bird's eye view map in your mind. But for people who are congenitally blind and used to moving personally through an area, they tend to be bound to an egocentric perspective in terms of always thinking of where objects are related to their own location and how they move to it. And in a series of studies, we found this uh, across a number of different spatial reference frame tests where we found that even if we blindfold sighted people and have them learn the location of objects by walking to them and touching, those sighted people and late blind people end up having the same pattern of results that suggests they form this allocentric map in their mind. But the congenitally blind always have this opposite pattern that's associated with having this egocentric perspective of the objects, where they're really thinking of the route they take between them based on their starting point, rather than having sort of an independent map. And in some ways, this also informs where people are doing in trying to make braille maps of areas for blind people, so like in train stations and such. Because having that viewpoint from above that's normally provided on a braille map doesn't necessarily map onto the mental representation they have <coughs> of space. And so that creates some problems in trying to communicate information the different senses. And so currently in the lab with both the tongue display unit and the voice, we're now using motion tracking to try and get a better appreciation of the abilities people have in using these devices and being able to direct themselves both in terms of these egocentric and allocentric uh, representations of both the locations of objects, but also in terms of being able to navigate to them or to understand the distance between them. And so particularly here, this is a new version of the voice we mocked up uh, in order to have a motion tracking helmet go along with it. Um, but besides the tone display unit, um, we're also in some ways going back to the 1960s. Uh, so in this case at Arizona State, they developed, very similar to Baki Rita, a chair with a vibro tactile background with the idea that this could be more useful in some sort of social setting. So if you have a person in a situation where they're interviewing someone, for example, or being interviewed, you wouldn't want to have the tongue display unit in your mouth while you're trying to answer questions or ask questions. And so we're trying to understand the limitations of what sort of information can be displayed on the person's back. In particular, working with representations and sound and touch of affective or emotional information. And so that way, if, for example, the person you're talking to, you tell some joke, you can see where they smile or if they scowl, and trying to reduce and code that information in a way that can be picked up on, even with this limited representation you can sense on your back. And ultimately, all this information is going to be going, this is just a close up of the resistors. What's fascinating from the neuroscience perspective is that all this information clearly is going to the right places. So across a number of studies examining um, both blind people and sighted people and information sent through vision, touch, <coughs> or sensory substitution devices is a fairly close overlap in key areas of the brain dedicated to spatial information, object recognition, or motion processing, where independent of how you receive the information, with learning, the brain is somehow able to then send it to the appropriate location. Because in most of the studies, this was all found through vision research, but now we're finding that if you provide the information through touch or sound, it still seems to be getting to the right place and be processed 
the way that you need to. Uh, we're now looking at a number of other different applications. Um, some of this falls in cross-modal collaboration. This is very much related to the project that uh, Nuno and I were both a part of uh, in the UK. In particular, trying to see how you can use technology like this to help the visually impaired and sighted work together on collaborative projects. Um, and also looking at educational and social benefits. So in terms of adult job training and mobility, but also inclusive access for the visually impaired and for blind children in education. Um, just a short look at this. Um, so we had this technology day, for example, at the Sensory Support Service, which Nuno was at um, in Bristol. And I think Nuno took this picture, yes. Yeah, you'll, you'll see uh, we have our, our colleagues, Fiore and Usama here, um, showing off some of the uh, apps and things that Nuno was a part of designing um, as part of that project. And we still work closely with that um, educational service now. And I also work extensively with an artist, Jane Pitt, uh, who is primarily interested in non-visual um, interactive experiences with people. She does sounding walks, where she'll take people out and have them really listen to the environment they're in. But then she also really likes to have people create sound as well. And so what she really liked about working with the voice is trying to deal with different ways of representing an environment through sound. Both its naturalistic sounds, but also trying to represent the visual information through sound and seeing how those two interact. And thanks to a grant from the Arts Council in England, um, we worked with an Indian musician, a tabla player, and a choreographer to try and think about the ways you can represent information cross modally So I was bringing in this technological side, the choreographer is trying to represent sound through body movement, and the tabla player tried to use the sounds created by the voice to create new musical pieces that again would be another way of representing an environment. One more view here of some of the playing going on out in different environments. And so just to summarize, I mean, the exciting thing now from a basic science perspective is sort of remapping the way the brain looks. So initially, most textbooks talk about how you have auditory areas, you have visual areas, tactile areas. But now we're getting an understanding that these areas seem to be more computationally determined. So the brain doesn't necessarily care which sense the information is coming from, it just cares what it needs to do with that information. And so if you're dealing with auditory information in a way that replicates vision, you process it in the visual parts of the brain. If you're processing even visual information in a way that's more time-based, you seem to use auditory parts of the brain. And so, thank you very much for your attention. If you want, there's, of course, all of our articles. We also have a general newspaper article that came out a couple years ago about our work. And um, Peter Mayer has been a, a great uh, collaborator in everything we've been doing. And one of the nice things about it is Peter Mayer is very much into having it be accessible technology, um, particularly for people um, from developing countries. And so the Basic Voice app is free. And furthermore, we now have our own training game app. And as soon as we get our papers accepted, we'll be publishing our little free uh, game app version of that.